Networking and marketing made simple is for you, the business owner who has a product, a service, or a message that you believe in. My name is Scott Aaron, and each week we'll take a behind the scenes look into the real world marketing and networking tactics and strategies for getting what you have in front of you to a lot more people. Thanks for spending time with me. And now let's get started. So before we dive into today's podcast, I just want to let you know that I am grateful and honored again to have Spotify as my sponsor for this podcast episode and future episodes. And the big question that people always ask me is, you know, how do you get started with a podcast? Well, what I want to tell you is that there's an all-in-one place that's absolutely free and it's called Spotify for Podcasters. And here's how it works. And this is exactly how I got started started with mine. Spotify for podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. I started with my phone. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating it right away. Then you can distribute it, your podcast to Spotify, Apple, everywhere your podcast can be heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. And when you want to take your conversations with your fans to the next level, like I like to, you can do Q and a, you can do polls, and that's the best way to get people talking. And with Spotify for podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads like this podcast subscriptions and so much more. And best of all, it's totally free, no catch. And again, I have now eclipsed 500 thousand listens on this podcast. So I want to thank each and every one of you. I could not recommend this anymore. And if you are listening to this and you are ready to start your podcast, start today, download the Spotify for podcasters app, or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started right away. And I cannot wait to listen to yours. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of Networking and Marketing Made Simple. Super excited about today's episode. A number of reasons. It's another interview, and I love hearing the stories, as I know all of you do as well, uh, of other entrepreneurs and business owners and how they've gotten to where they are. But uh, I'm also excited because we're going to be talking about uh, a a topic, and it's revolving around... um, fractional positions within businesses and companies, uh, but also the role of a, of a CFO, but more so the role of a fractional CFO and what that actually means. I think uh, in the day and age that we're in in entrepreneurship and, and small business ownership, we hear all these new phrases, new terms, new words, and we're not really sure what they are. So we're going to kind of go into full spectrum of what all of that means, but also how someone like the guest I have for you today, who is a fractional CFO with the resources and tools that uh, they possess, how it could help you and your business. So with all that being said, Stacey Millard, welcome to today's episode. Thanks so much for having me, Scott. Excited. Well, I'm excited to have you here. So before we get into the obvious roles of a fractional CFO, let's, let's rewind before we move forward. If, if you had to go back um, to a moment of time in your business journey that you felt was that catalytic moment for you that kind of set you on this path that you've been and are currently on, what would you say that moment was for you? Yeah. So I come from a background as a CPA. And funny enough, I went to business school. I was a numbers girl. And in growing my business, I was not looking at my numbers. I was a couple years into business. I set out to do things differently, lead a team better, lead my customers and clients to better success. I wanted to provide them a great service and have some freedom for myself and my family. But I just found myself working constantly and not really feeling like I was having an impact anywhere. I wasn't achieving like what I had set out to. And what I realized a couple years into doing this, like we're bringing on clients, it's all going okay, but it doesn't feel right. And finally, I had to take a pill of my own advice and start taking a look at the numbers, which felt a little bit authentic, inauthentic to start with, because it felt like 
but I'm here to just do better for people. Like, why do I have to look at the money? But it was that moment in time when I just finally said like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to look at the math. I'm going to see what's working, what's not, and start looking really at what's making, what's bringing in revenue and, and generating profit in our business. And everything changed. I would say in terms of how satisfied my team was, how we grew exponentially from that point forward, where we had a couple clients trickling in constantly, like now it was exponential. We had more work than we could keep up with. We were winning awards. I all of a sudden had more time off. I was able to hire key employees. Like it was all pivotal. And then the way we started giving back and I started giving back to other business owners, like it all happened from that moment on. You know, it's, I think it's just really cool how we can all go back in time to a specific moment and how it, it acts as that, I guess, launching pad for everything else that, you know, obviously we're doing today and, you know, kind of staying on that, that path and that journey that you've been on when, when you were kind of starting out, um, I guess you can couple it into to being in in the corporate world. What what were some of the the biggest lessons that you learned in that journey that you were able to not only learn from, but you were able to bring into everything that you're doing now to help other people? Yeah. So number one would be really from a numbers perspective, like we would never look at investing in another business. Like if we're thinking stock market, like where are we going to place our hard earned money? We would never consider like investing in that business without looking at their finances and what, you know, type of leader that that person running that company is. And we forget to do that in our own businesses. How am I investing my time and how am I investing my money? So that was a really like key learning moment for me of like, Hey, wait a minute, what am I doing? Cause there's so many things that I was doing as a leader that I would never pay somebody else to do. And I got really clear on what really mattered The other thing that really changed things for me was starting to build a business that like I showed up in those roles, but more so being able to remove myself from the business as we were scaling, like how can we have income and impact, but it doesn't have to rely on me being here every day Um, because everything from there, you know, I finally got some time off when I got time off, I showed up better. I led my team better. We, we helped clients differently. And so that was another key kind of like moment and lesson. Like, how do I remove myself from the business without, with still the understanding of like, I'm, I am the leader of the business. I'm always going to be needed here, but I don't have to be doing everything. You know, I I think there's certain times where we, we wear this like badge of honor that we're really proud that we wear all the hats and we do all the things. And I mean, you can share what your experience is, but whenever I tried to do that, it would lead to burnout. It would lead to uh, being very dissatisfied. I was very uh, just not loving what I was doing because I felt like I was working more in my business instead of working on my business. And a quote that my wife loves to use is that you can't see the label from inside the jar. And I feel like a lot of business owners are, still trying to be and do all the things. And it isn't until you start outsourcing and bringing in external eyeballs on what it is that you're looking to do, where you can then uncover some of those bottlenecks and you can uncover some of those problems that are holding a lot of people back from really achieving the success that they want. And what have you seen in not only the people and clients and businesses that you have helped, but You know, entrepreneurship has grown immensely since the pandemic came about in 2020. So many people, you know, ran to the online world and tried to start and launch businesses. Some succeeded, some failed. What what have you been seeing yourself on that, that CFO side of things from a lot of these new entrepreneurs that are not necessarily trying to do all the things, but if they could go back and do things just a little bit differently? their path would have been that much different. So I see sort of two trends with entrepreneurs and especially in the online space. Number one is the type who's going to do everything themselves. 
And what I'm seeing is a lot of burnout and I see them hire when it's way too late. And they're in this perpetual cycle of I'm going to hire because I know I'm too busy and now I need to bring somebody in and then they hire, but they don't really have time to train them. So they end up dissatisfied with the quality that they're getting and they fire somebody and they're still too busy. And it's just this cycle until somebody interrupts it and says, you know, you're going to have to just be a little bit too busy for a little while to really bring somebody key onto your team. The other side of it is I see people who are like, I'm never making that mistake. Like I'm not doing this all myself. I know I'm going to have to have a team someday. And they start to try to outsource their success, especially with a bunch of subcontractors. And they're looking at everybody that's like, I can grow your business. I can do this. And they're promising the results. So instantly they're hiring before they've even really reiterated, like, what is it that they want to do? They're not clear on their messaging and they're outsourcing their success. But what we know about subcontractors and like when we're working with any specialist really is that like you're, they're only as good as the information that you give them. So when you're early in your business, you're not clear on what you really want from them. You're not clear on the direction. You haven't even stumbled through enough mistakes to really know that yet. And So when we're giving them that, we're running out of cash runway. And by that, I mean, we spend so much money up front before we're even really sure of ourselves. It's like we haven't even hit adolescence yet of our business. And we spend so much money up front. And then all of a sudden we're like, wow, I'm going to have to bootstrap this and do this all myself. And it's like, we could have relieved a lot of the pain of making really strategic decisions and knowing like, okay, I'm not going all in up front. Also, I'm not, you know, hoarding my cash, but making some balanced decisions about how you want to spend your money and then, you know, who you're bringing in to help you. So with with that being said, there's different phases of business ownership. In the very beginning, and I, I like talking about the beginning stages because I think that's also the most crucial. When you start to get to the mid and, and I would say scaling levels of business, things are a little bit different. From a financial perspective, what are some of the unnecessary things that you see beginning entrepreneurs and business owners spending money on that they really shouldn't? Social media? <laughs> I'm saying well, that with a laugh ex- because, exp- oh my god. Expand on that. Expand on that. Okay. My friends are going to kill me because I work with a lot of marketing companies. No, it's a, it's, but... listen, it's it's all good. I mean, we're, we're being open and transparent here because again, it, yeah. you live by experience, right? Okay. So first of all, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. And so that's why we're having this you're, conversation. You're on the right podcast then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but also I think a lot of solopreneurs and service-based businesses. So we're like leaving out anybody who's product-based in this conversation, but really solopreneurs um, and service-based businesses need to be where their people are. And most of the time your bang for your buck is not Instagram. It's not TikTok. You're not converting. You don't have something that they're going to buy and you're not converting enough off of them. Like if you're a chiropractor, you just need to go connect with a few few doctors. If you're a marketing specialist, go find a couple of accountants who have a ton of clients who need marketing help because those accountants are doing taxes and they're like, wow, you need to increase your sales because you're not making profit, right? Like go find where your people are. And I would say, um, LinkedIn, because there's just such a high potency of people really looking to connect for business. It's not entertainment. Yeah, you know, I, there's a a hybrid term called edutainment, which is half education, half entertainment. Yeah, but like, is that so? My argument is starting in business, you want to be in edut- edutainment. Like, is that like, do you have the dollars to become like, you know, the next, I don't know, your encyclopedia, basically? Like, that's not what we're doing. We don't have the money to create just this, you know, entertainment platform. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And you know, the, the thing that always gets me, um, I, I, I would say it bothers me actually. It's a trigger how so many people, not, not, not the business owner, the, I would say the people that are using the social media platforms from a user standpoint, how much weight they give the vanity metrics of social media, including LinkedIn. You know, they really measure the amount of success that someone has by how many likes their stuff gets, how many comments, how many views, how many shares, 
all those things. And again, there's, you know, I have a very large network on LinkedIn and there's stuff that I'll put out there and it'll get immense traction. And then example today, I did a LinkedIn live, which I thought was a great topic. It's how to get more LinkedIn recommendations on your profile because I have over 500 and people always ask me, how did you get so many recommendations? So I did a whole training of how to do so. And there were a few people on there. I thought it would be more of a hot topic because of the poll that I did earlier in the week, but it doesn't mean it wasn't good content. It was still really good content, but I think we we live in this society now where the measure of someone's success is by things that you actually can't really measure, right? You can you can measure likes, comments, and shares and all that stuff, but what is that translating to on the back end in someone's business bank account? Is that actually equating to... Uh, monetary increases of their income. And I, I will I will confidently say most likely they're not making money off of that content. Look at what Instagram did, Stacey, right? What, what did Instagram do? They demonetized the platform. I, I was actually, I wasn't getting paid much, but I was getting paid to do reels on, on Instagram, right? And I would make... 150, 200 bucks a month, like nothing crazy, but they took that away. And again, because so many people were, you, people think that these influencers, and now there's the term micro influencer. Listen, the, the, the best aspect of running a business is being a person of value. I, and and that's what really lights me up. And that's what I try to teach people. You know, I, I'm never going to be that guy that's jumping around and pointing and then jumping and all of a sudden I'm wearing a new outfit. Like that's just not going to be me. Uh, I am there. I'm on LinkedIn to educate, to inform, and to position myself as the expert in the space that I'm at. And this is another interesting topic because you see all these quote unquote LinkedIn experts, right? They're, they're claiming they're an expert, yet they have no LinkedIn newsletter. They're not even leveraging LinkedIn creator mode. They're not doing LinkedIn lives. All they're doing is selling and posting about their own products, their own systems. Their own, they're doing nothing to add value to people's lives. And it just drives me nuts because there are so many really great people that are falling for these really, really slimy sales tactics and wasting a ton of money. You know what, though? So this is my thought is that I think that some of us have such a big passion on our heart and we want to do it faster. Like we we just want to be there. We want to be doing the thing already. So we instantly look at like, how can I have that impact quickly? And we're in just a world of the best marketing wins. So the best person who manages to connect with you on an emotional level and manages to tell you, I can get you there faster is going to win. So it may be a slimy like LinkedIn expert who, when you hit their program has no, no value, or maybe it's on Instagram because sometimes I do think platforms have, have a, a place for people, right? Like Instagram, probably for a fitness industry, that's probably the place to be. You're not B2B, you're B2C, like you're directing with consumers. You probably want to interrupt them when they're mid scroll. So maybe that is a great place to meet people or, you know, there's a time and a place, but it's, it's really up to the business owner. And what we're forgetting is just being conscious of where we're at conscious when we're investing, like, are these people saying, you know, they're going to get me here to here. Do I actually think that's going to happen? What would it really take for me to get to that spot? And, you know, where are my people? Like, let's just be more present in our businesses the other thing is, I think that people don't look at the money. You mentioned like, oh, you know, you know, it's not getting results in your bank account, but that's because people don't know how to look at money. We weren't trained to do that. So likes, we, we can measure that easy. We know what that's meant since, you know, 15 years of, of social media almost now. And it's like, we know what a like means, but we don't know how to convert them. And so I love what you're talking about. I love, you know, my mission is like, let's start bringing it back to, tangible results for people, their actual end goal, like what is the feeling and what does your life look like when you achieve the goal? It's not likes, it's something deeper than that. And when you ask, you know, like the seven layers of questions, let's really get focused so we can do business the right way instead of being disappointed. So I don't have an accounting background, but I love numbers. 
I, I love numbers. Um, I know it's weird. I, I love mailing off my quarterly tax payment checks. Like it's just, I, I was, I learned to celebrate that because. Can I, can I ask you a question? So yeah. like, if you see a post and you're like, you see one performs better than the other, are you going to yourself and you're saying like, oh, like this didn't convert, like I'm disappointed or you're just no. like, hmm, let me figure that out. Okay, like this didn't work. I'm I'm gonna tweak this and try this next time. Not really. So I, I do a social media audit at the end of every week. I go back and I see, you know, what post I put out there garnered the, the largest amount of impressions and engagements. But here's the thing. And I, I, I tell this to people all the time. You can come up with the best content in the world. You'll never defeat the algorithm. Yeah. Ever. So what, what's going on on LinkedIn right now, it, the algorithm has already changed. It's already different. You don't know. But for me, I know exactly what content I produce gets the best organic engagement. For me, it's my LinkedIn polls, number one. My LinkedIn newsletter articles, number two, and my LinkedIn lives are number three. Those are my top three performing pieces of content week in, week out. What gets zero engagement are my personal branded posts where I still give tangible tips and I usually uh, attach either a picture of me or myself and Nancy crickets every single time. And, and again, it's not any, I'm not doing anything wrong. You know, LinkedIn all the social media platforms for that matter are in control of what they want to show. And here's a prime example, Stacey. If you ever notice on Facebook, do you know what, what gets the best engagement? Someone dying, someone getting married, someone's birthday, uh, someone getting engaged, someone giving birth. When, when my, fa my father, unfortunately, he was diagnosed with a rare form of brain cancer uh, about three months ago. He's doing great. Um, his chemo is working. Uh, I made a post about it, right? And I do subsequent posts, just pictures of him and I when we're out to lunch or we're just hanging out, just, you know, just keeping people updated with, with, without fail, three, 400, 500 likes. And then, you know, I'll take a, a picture of our koi pond and some of the pretty flowers that are blooming. And it's like two or three likes, right? So it's, you, you can, you can see and you could predict, like, you know, this is going to get engagement. And I don't, I don't post my father's cancer journey for engagement. That's not, I do it because he wants me. He's like, I want you to share my journey. Your people need to see what I'm going through. But you can also see uh, the, the reflection side of that, of what social media shows. If you look at Instagram, right? What, what, what posts get the most engagement on Instagram? The ones that reveal the most skin. And that's, unfortunate mm -hmm. and it's sad and it pains me to see the way that people are using their bodies to sell and to get likes and comments and and I can pick things out like that when I see a picture I'm like ooh clickbait I can I can smell it and see it from a mile away things are a little bit different on LinkedIn I would say from a professional aspect but I did a poll the other day in a in a in a private group that I'm in and I asked, like, you know, uh, what do you think people mistakenly think LinkedIn is? And the three options were um, only for recruiters to get a job or to use it like Facebook and Instagram. And the number one answer was people mistakenly use it. for. And there was over 380 votes. And 85% of the people that voted said too many people think they need to use it like Facebook and Instagram. And people always reach out to me like I work for LinkedIn. They're like, Scott, when are they going to make updates? When are they going to kick these people? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I just unfollow the people that you don't want to see that crap anymore and just stay in your own lane. Yeah. So I think what stands out for me, though, from you saying all that is that you're very objective about it all. You're not making it mean anything about yourself. Any of the numbers, whether it's stats on what people like or the financial aspect, you're just like, you look at the patterns and then you see how they can help benefit you. 
right? So you're like, okay, I want to help more people. How do I do that? Whether it's helping people by sharing your dad's story or helping people by leveraging LinkedIn, you just look at it and you're like, how can I use this number? Yes or no. You're not like, oh man, I, I suck. I better I go suck. lay in I bed should, today. I'm closing up shop for good. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I think we take numbers too seriously about, you know, they mean something about me. They mean I'm not doing good enough or I don't know enough. And we take everything so personally and that's why people avoid the numbers. And that's the thing. I I was one of those people, right? I did not want to look at my bank account because I was fearful of the number I would see. Now I love it. And it's not because there's more money in there. I mean, obviously that helps, but I've learned to embrace the roller coaster ride of business because, you know, Nancy and I are in a place where we we have very consistent months, month in, month out. We see some growth, small dip. We see some growth. It's just the normal ebbs and flows of business. But there are, I mean, this is such a hot topic. There, there are, there are so many people that a don't want to look at their bank accounts for the fear of what's in there. But Stacy, between you and me. There are, it it is alarming. It is alarming the number of people that do not have disposable income to invest in their business. Like, I'll give you an example. So, Nancy and I did, and, and I would love to hear your thoughts on this. So, Nancy and I did, we did a workshop. We were talking about this in the pre show. Um, we did a workshop in May. We had 475 people register, free, free, free workshop. It's called Get Your Business Organized in Five Days. So we took people through our process of how to get your business streamlined, organized, and ready to scale. And of the 475, we had about 80 consistent people each night. So about 20%, which unfortunately is par for the course these days. There's so many people that register for events and just don't even show up. So of the 80, we converted six into our program. And it's a DIY program. It doesn't involve us. It's already pre-built. And and it was very fair price, $1,500 for a year in full access or six payments of $297. Very manageable, right? We're talking about $1,800 $1,800 tops as an investment. And literally Nancy built this beautiful course. And we, we six people joined, which we're very happy about. We had about 28 people already in there from prior, which means there was about 74 people that could not get over the fence for, for whatever reason. Maybe they couldn't get out of their own way. Maybe... And again, Nancy always talks about there's three reasons why people don't buy. They don't trust you. They don't trust the product or they don't trust themselves. And the majority of the time it's, they don't trust themselves. But what, what was revealing to myself and Nancy was the amount of people that we heard from that said, I would love to do this, but I can't afford it right now. And I, I I always do a lot of self-reflection because I I just have such a heart of service for entrepreneurs and business owners, because it's tough out there for some people, right? Mm-hmm. But the, 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 what I always say to people, if you don't make this investment, what's it going to cost your business? What's it going to cost your business if you don't make this investment? Because people always say, you know what? In six months, things will be different. In three months, things will be different. But Stacy, you and I know once something gets taken off of your plate, it's replaced with something else. So what wh- I'm, I'm <laughs> I'll, laughing I'll, because I'll just let you go off of that. Well, yeah, I'm laughing because last week I was sitting at this round table and one of the other people there said like, I'm going to invest in a CFO when, when in a few months, when things are good. And I'm like, girl, like it's not going to get good because you did, you don't look at your numbers. They don't happen by accident. You do business in a way that perpetuates the results you've been getting for years now, and nothing's going to change until you interrupt those patterns. So the same thing with investing in yourself, like I, I, I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but my question is like, no, get, get how on your many, soapbox. how many subscriptions to, you know, TV channels and everything else do you have? How many times have you eaten Uber Eats or skipped the dishes this last week? And you're going to tell me that you can't afford the, you know, 60 bucks a week 
to really change your life. But I think it comes back to like, it's a, it's a cop out. I can't afford it really means I don't think I'm going to put the effort in to get a return on this investment. That's, well, that's where I'm going to leave that. <laughs> no, I, and, and again, you, you left it in the perfect place because when Nancy always likes to re, we, we reframe it. When someone says, um, I don't have the time right now, you're basically saying it's not important to me. Mm-hmm. And going back to that, that, that woman who said she needs to wait a couple months when things are good to make, to get a CFO. No, you get a CFO right now when things aren't good. So you can make sure that things are good a few months from now. So people just have it backwards and it drives me crazy because you, you make those in, if something that you are looking to do serves you in a way where, you know, it's going to fix my bottleneck. It's going to allow me to jump from point A to point B. I'm stuck right here. I, I can't get across the bridge. If you know that it's going to help you every, just like your, just, just to your point, you will find a way to make that investment. Now I'm not telling people to go get loans to hire people, but Mm-mm. you're spending money every single day on shit that you probably do not even need. But yet when it comes to voicing a problem and a concern about where your business is, and man, my business still isn't where I want it to be after three years. Well, why? Because you are still trying to be all the things to all the people all the time instead of, instead of outsourcing it. So let's pivot before we we start to wind down. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like we could talk for hours. Anyway. The role of a fractional CFO, because this is something that a lot of people don't know what that even means, because obviously you you are beyond well-educated in this. You are all about numbers. You're all about helping people run profitable businesses. First, what is a fractional CFO compared to a regular CFO at a company? Um, and the second question to that is, at, at what stage or at what point for a business owner should they really start considering looking to hire and work with someone like you? Yeah. So when you're thinking of a CFO, really, we are taking somebody with that knowledge of understanding like the patterns in the numbers. They're able to help you decipher what it means be objective about what's working, what's not, are we getting towards the goals? And especially when they're like in terms of finance. So the fractional CFO, all that does is take that where normally you are running a fortune 500 company, or you need something, somebody big in order to be able to sustain that position, that knowledge is not cheap. And so we're able to bring it down into a fractional, like a little piece. So I, instead of me being on your payroll and you being like, how do I afford this? You're getting a little snippet of my time, but in a way that I show up like a partner in your business of like, how do I help use those numbers to help you get to your goals? So you're getting me at a fraction of the price that you would, you would otherwise, and you're getting me a lot faster to help you scale to that point where maybe you can afford somebody full time. So I work with people that are at least six figures and higher. Before that, I'd love for you to take a course, understand the numbers, but it starts getting more detailed after you hit six figures. And once once you're starting to bring on full-time team members, things become more complicated in terms of like, understanding the different levers that help make profit in your business and understanding, you know, the trickle down effect of different decisions, they just get more complicated. And that's when having somebody dedicated to help make those decisions becomes um, more important. Before that, you could probably stumble through, like actually looking at your numbers. So we have a course that helps you determine as a solopreneur, like, how do I make profit without killing myself doing it? And then after that, like we start working with people one-on-one to mentor them. It's not an everyday type of thing. We're not like having chats with you because I actually want you to be so freaking confident in your numbers that at most you can talk to me once a week. If you need somebody to manage your money every day, you're living in survival mode. That is not where we want you to be. So 
Um, we work with people just to make really wise investment decisions, map out their next, um, maybe their next level of scaling. Like, what does that look like? What do you need to bring in financially? How do we have the cash to do that? So those are some examples of the types of things that we help people through. And mostly it's about confidence, right? Putting the numbers to it, having somebody go and say to you, like, where, where are the risks? Where might we fall short? If we do fall short, how are we going to make sure that we're able to get back up? So I know that you have actually a free guide, but also uh, a very, very generous offer to my audience. So talk a little bit about the free guide that uh, people can find in the description of this episode or the email that was sent out about this and that very generous offer uh, that we talked about before we started recording today. Yeah. So we have the profit playbook, which is a guide. It's got 30 ways to increase your profit and just helps you understand really the levers that generate profit in your business. Phenomenal guide. It's like my favorite thing. If I, all I ever did was sell this guide, I'd be in heaven, but I also have an offer. I've, I've done this course with people so many times. I got asked for it over and over again. We call it the business blueprint. There's really five pillars to really having a business that you love in terms of that impact that you're looking for, the time freedom and making money. And I teach people how to do all of that. So that course, it'll be in the show notes, but it'll be 50% off of the course business blueprint. It is like, is perfect for solopreneurs who are looking to scale. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And uh, just Thank you for that very generous offer. I know my audience is really going to appreciate it. So before I get to my final question, if someone is interested in any of the programs that you have, um, I know you do one-on-one -on -one consulting and I know you do VIP days. Uh, if someone was interested in, in learning more about how they can, they don't want, they want to skip the free stuff. They want to skip the course. They just, they want to get to Stacy. What's the best way for people to connect with you, you know, via website or online to find out more? Yeah. Hello at stacymillard.com is an email. I answer those quickest. And then Instagram is the other place we live. There's a link in the bio to book a time. If you're like, I really need to chat with you, make sure we're a good fit. I know when we're talking about money, it's so personal. So people like that, and um, we make sure that's accessible. Awesome. So everything that we spoke about today and all the ways that we can connect with Stacy and everything that she's offering, you're not going to have to look far. They will be in the show notes. So please do if this really intrigued you and you want to get out of your own way, and you need someone to help and guide you, uh, I couldn't recommend Stacy anymore. So please do reach out to her. So Stacy, final question before we sign off, what does success truly mean to you? To me, success is impact. It's leaving the legacy beyond yourself, having impacted people's lives. And there's a couple requirements. For me, it's having the time freedom to show up for my family be able to live a life where I'm like taking care of my mind and my body. It's having a financial, you know, impact because we all know businesses have to make money in order to survive that success, unfortunately. And it's having an, a greater impact on the world around you through your community. I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, that is everything, you know, I have a gratitude journal that I write in every single night and uh, it, it goes right along the lines of everything that you said. And you know, having that that time freedom to to spend it with who you want, when you want, um, but also having that that legacy. You know, whether it's a monetary yeah. legacy or just the the legacy of the impact that you're leaving for those to walk alongside, um, or years to come. It's such an impactful thing. So, Stacy, just appreciate you so much. Loved our conversation today, and uh, I do hope that people reach out to you after hearing this episode because you are. Uh, obviously the expert in this space and they deserve to work with you and just really appreciate you. So thank you so much for being here today. Oh, such a pleasure. Thanks, Scott. Absolutely. So again, uh, all the information of how to connect with Stacy and to find out about more of her services and her programs, obviously her free guide, that will be in the show notes and the description of this episode. So everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. Love and gratitude. And I'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much again for checking out today's episode. And if you are listening through iTunes, Spotify, wherever you are, 
please leave me a rating and review. Let me know what you loved, what you would like to see improved, or ideas you have for future episodes. And if you are interested in taking your business to the next level, don't hesitate to go to my website, www.scotterron.net, where you can schedule a free discovery call with me, where I can learn more about you, your business, what you're struggling with, and how we can work together. And don't forget to check out my wife, Nancy, and mine, our free community on Facebook called LinkedIn Leads for Life. We would love to see you in there. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you, everyone, for your support. Grateful for each and every one of you.